So what's the difference between reverb A and reverb B? Well, I can tell you one costs $350 and the other one costs $350 because you're listening to the exact same plugin just with source material EQ'd differently. Could this be why my compressor plugin sounds differently when the guy in the advert is using it or is there something else going on? Stick around, in this video I'll show you why EQing your source material a certain way may actually be helpful when you're trying to decide which compressor or reverb to use. So guys, when I say uh, an opportunity often overlooked by audio engineers, this is what I'm talking about. What you heard before was just a reverb plugin, in this case the uh, LX480 from Relab, doing large hole and stage. The difference in the two signals that you heard is this plugin. This is just digging out 12 dBs at 400 on a snare. Let me show you what you heard. This was the first signal just a snare drum, acoustically recorded, going to the reverb. The second signal, I engaged the EQ, digging out 12 dB at 400 and boosting 6 dBs. This is what you get. First up, now can you imagine using two or three years of your life trying to develop a reverb plugin like this only to have people and when I say a reverb plugin I'm gonna show you that the exact same thing applies to compression plugins. Try using two or three years of your life figuring out how to make a goddamn 480L uh, remake and then have people going well it's kind of murky, it's kind of boxy, it's kind of gone uh, with the adjectives and the real problem is if I strip off all of the reverb let me make this track pink so we can follow along. This is the snare drum and if I close up all of this shade, I have a snare drum that sounds without just a, uh, just a gate, without the EQ it sounds like this. This signal was what was triggering the reverb plugin when I said that it was kind of murky or boxy 400 uh, hertz ish. So if I engage the reverb, and I know I overdid the reverb, but it's just to exemplify what I'm talking about. Listen to what happens when I engage the EQ. And I know what you're going to say, but Klaus, it's louder. Yeah but not exactly louder because I've actually gain matched it. So if I just solo out the snare and I bypass the plugin and I measure the peak, you can see this is the peak meter in Logic and it's gonna cap out at minus seven dB full scale. I engage the EQ, it's gonna cap out at minus seven dB. So peak for peak, I have the exact same peak signal. I got there by just finding what I thought sounded boxy in the snare. And I just went the other way with the plugin. It goes to minus 12. Why not pull that out? And then with the gain or the output makeup of the plugin, I just tried to hit around the same spot. So. It's hitting more or less exactly if I go to a 6.2, like this, it's going to peak at minus 7. So pound for pound, this is the exact same transient response. One of them is just made up of frequencies without as much low mid. I want to show you something that's really specific to reverbs. If I solo out the reverb and take into consideration that the signal that's sending to the reverb is peaking at the exact same point, I know there's something called perception of loudness. That means that when we get more bass and more treble 
or more high end, it's gonna sound louder to our ears. That's just the way the human anatomy is made up. So I'm gonna do the exact same thing. I have the snare going to the reverb. I'm gonna bypass the EQ and let's watch the peak meter on the reverb channel without the added <laughs> It's not exactly added high end and bottom end, but I've, I've taken out so much of the low mid, what was masking the low end and the high end. So let's just take a peek at the normal snare going through the reverb plugin. It's gonna be peeking around. Minus 17.3. If I engage the EQ, remember the signal feeding the reverb is at, at the exact same level. Let's look at the peak meter, minus 7.3, when it was just the ordinary uh, snare or unaffected snare going into the reverb. Hmm. So we gained about a dB when we put in the process, uh, the EQ, we gain about a dB into the reverb. And that's because when you think about what a reverb is, it's a simulation of a room. <laughs> Even though so, the critics would say that the um, 4 ADL wasn't exactly natural sounding. Perhaps this isn't the best contender when we're talking about realistic reverbs. Even though it's not realistic, the algorithms in this reverb behave like reverb like it does. So if you have a bright room and you put more high end into an already bright room, it's going to be exaggerated. If you have a really bassy room, think like a church. If you play a bass drum in a church, the low end is, is going to hang on for a lot longer than the high end. This is the exact same thing. So the dB that we're gaining when we engage the EQ, even though the snare isn't exactly louder going in, the reverb is peaking a dB louder. This is just what happens when you're using a, a reverb. Now, if I disengage this and use my plug search, mm -hmm, thank you, and use perhaps like a space designer, one of my favorite plugins, sorry, presets for drums is the gated reverb, snare, long or studio snare, I can't really remember, but listen to this. So this is more of like an 80s kind of vibe. This is Space Designer. Remember, we're just listening to the uh, return with the reverb on. So I've just disengaged or bypassed the EQ on the snare. And you can see it peaks at minus 20.7. I'm gonna engage the EQ. So not much louder, but that's because of the makeup of, in this case, the IR that's being used in the Space Designer. Now, if we listen to the snare and the reverb to together, I'm going to dial back the reverb to something more manageable, like minus 12 uh, dB. Listen to what happens. And this is just the Space Designer included in Logic. So this is the snare without EQ. With EQ. And remember, the snare signal is peaking at minus seven, uh, if, even though I'm in, uh, engaging and disengaging the plugin. Now, what I think is really, really important is you got to remember that this is not a process that's just solely have to do with reverbs. Now, I've just, I'm just gonna bypass the reverb and I'm gonna put on this plugin. This is just like an SSL compressor, but I'm gonna show you something. When I, I have this preset that actually I got off a Tom Lord LG session. And it goes like this, high pass the sidechain up to about 500 Hertz, meaning it's just the high end of the snare that's gonna be affecting this. And as I start to dial in, the compression without the added benefit of the EQ, listen to what happens to the snare. So this is compression on a snare on EQ. And like the true asshole I am, I'm just gonna unbypass the plug and do it again. Now we already know it should be peaking at minus seven. And it's more or less hitting. Just to be completely anal about it, I'm gonna dial back this to 5.2. So this is without the compression, with the compression, and the grid button, which is doing grit, I suppose. So it's around 8 dBs of compression. That's 
that's pretty much on a snare. Not for me, but for a lot of more natural sounding guys. Listen to what happens. I'm gonna do this while the track, not while the track, but while the snare track is playing, I'm gonna unbypass the snare and listen to what happens and see the meter reading. So I'm hearing something funny here because first of all, this compressor in the bypassed state of the EQ is giving me minus seven on the peak meter. When I unbypass the EQ, engage the EQ, it's giving me uh, 0 0.4 dBs more. What's happening there? I haven't touched anything. Well, basically what is happening is that I'm feeding more transient information. Transient is the very first part of a signal. A snare drum is an excellent choice if you want to experience what, what transients really are. This is the initial part, sorry, this is the initial part of the sound and then this is the tail. A snare is an exceptionally good signal to judge stuff like digital transients on. So if you go back to the compressor, it's a compressor that tries to react at an interval of one millisecond. And listen to what happens if I exaggerate the high end on the plugin. So this is without. I'm just doing, I don't know, 10 to 12. Let's do, let's do 10. 60 B at 10 without the EQ. We can see that the peak meter on the compressor reaches between, I would say, 7 or 8 dBs. And as I engage the EQ, I'm betting it's going to be more. and it goes from seven to eight to more eight and nine dBs. Okay, so if we zoom out, take just a moment to pause and think about this. There's a reason why all of the big guys use a lot of EQ when they're compressing with the brute, with the brute force of like, you know, eight dBs. And that's because compression reacts to transients. Transients live more in the high range of the frequencies. So if you want to exaggerate the effect of compression, you can use a signal with more high end, just as we saw with the reverb. So this is the combination of reverb. I'm going to go back to the original LX4480. And I'm going to bypass the EQ, there's still lots of compression, 8 dBs of compression on the snare, but listen to what it does to the overall picture. So I can hear there's compression on the very first part of the snare, it's just not exciting. Just to be absolutely fair, I'm gonna dial back, I have no, I know I dialed in 6, 6 dBs of 10k, so I'm probably gonna have to dial the gain back just to match the original minus 7 peak. So now it's peaking the exact same spot. So this is without the compression, uh, sorry, compression and reverb, but without the EQ. And remember, if you like the sound of the EQ snare, <laughs> it's a shit ton, sorry, pardon my French. It's a shit ton of EQing, right? Minus 12 dB at 400 Hertz and 6 dB at 10K, and it's not even shelved. So this is, and still 8 dBs of compression, just listen to how much harder compression smacks when the snare is properly EQ'd. I'm gonna do two snare hits without the EQ and two with, starting off with the EQ bypassed. I hope you can hear the difference and in peak value, meaning perceived, perceived loudness, it, it, we gain such a big momentum in the perceived loudness part of the song. Even though the snare isn't really peaking any louder, we just perceive it as being louder in the track. But the very last part of this puzzle is this little plugin. It's just a gate 
and when I bypass it, this is what happens. Without the EQ, with the EQ, Now, I stole this trick from Tom Lord Algae using tracks that's just small blips. I have a snare track just being ever the smallest, tiniest blip of the snare doing the gate on the actual snare track that you're hearing. Because this is such a big part of actually having the balls to use enough EQ on poorly recorded tracks to get them into shape. When you're going up against the big guys, you're at quite the disadvantage. You're gonna have to p compete against better producers in better studios, using probably all around better instruments, used by better players on better songs with more, with better arrangements. So you're gonna have to make up for a lot. So if you're that guy using just a 57 on a snare going into a normal digital interface, this is not gonna be far off if you want to get a snare like your, your favorite Metallica song or your favorite, I don't know, insert Goo Goo Dolls. I don't know. I don't know any modern song, so shoot me. But this is such a part of getting that aggressive punch with the EQ and the compression. If I bypass this, the gate on the snare, all my hard work goes out the window. If I instead engage the snare gate, It seems like I can have my cake and eat it too. And I know I overdid the EQ. I know I overdid the compression. But ask yourself, when you heard that first example, reverb A, reverb B, which did you prefer? So can we just for a moment entertain the possibility that perhaps your new compressor plugin or your new reverb plugin is not exactly what's holding your back. Perhaps it's your poorly recorded shitty track that sounds like a snare drum being hit with a fucking mashed potato. Thanks for stopping by and go compress some snares.